to start recording. Okay. Medium, mm -hmm. record, or I can do it. I did it. Okay. Good okay. afternoon, everyone. Screen got little. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Miriam Aliso, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, the OSA Parent Program Meeting and Webinar on Promise Centers and Family Engagement. And I want to make this. Okay. Before we get started, I'd like you to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. So, you will notice on your screen a screenshot of an example of the GoToWebinar interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default. Okay. And questions. To the right of the GoToWebinar PowerPoint viewer is the GoToWebinar control panel. This is where you have the option to select the way you hear the webinar. Raise your hand and ask questions by text. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions for staff pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect this and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. There is also a handout that has the, the PowerPoint in PDF format for today's webinar. OK, Deborah. Uh, I think I'm going to start. This is uh, Carmen Sanchez um, at the Office of Special Education Programs. And so um, before we get to the main part of our webinar today, which has to do with the PROMISE projects, we're going to be first be hearing from Deborah Jennings, who's going to talk about something that's available now on the SIPA website specifically for all of you as parent centers that you can use in communicating the kind of work that you do. So. Deborah, take it away. Thank you, Carmen. And hello and welcome to all of my Parent Center colleagues. I just uh, wanted to make sure that we share with you the exciting news of all of the um, outreach and the impact that we have had as Parent Centers over the course of the project year 2016 to 2017. Uh, the data collection was completed by um, every parent center except for the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico who were um, excused from the, uh, because of the hurricanes that were occurring at the time of the data collection. Um, with that, we had over 900,000 contacts. And what we have, um, sh are going to share with you in the next slide is the ways that you can access the more detailed information about the national results um, where we have designed an infographic and we also include a summary in a text format of the national results from across the parent center network, uh, not only in terms of our contacts and our reach, but also the impact um, in terms of the ways that parents and that parents have been able to benefit from the services of each of our centers. Um, for your use as a parent center and your dissemination to your funders and your partners and families, we also developed an infographic that you can adapt to include your individual achievements and results um, so that you can disseminate that. And that infographic is accompanied by a, just a quick two-page guide that explains what you need to do in order to adapt the infographic. And then on the next slide, um, when you download the handout in the control panel on your right, you'll see that there is uh, handouts. You'll be able to download this entire presentation. And in that presentation, there is this slide, which provides you with direct links to each of the resources that you see outlined here, the infographic, 
the summary and plain text, your adaptable infographic for your use, as well as the two-page guide to use um, in order to, to create your own infographic. Um, so with that, um, if you have any questions or you need assistance, please call the SIPR project assistant, um, Miriam Alizo, or actually contact her by email as well. And she's at malizo at spanadvocacy.org. And, and she will be able to help you and or direct you to exactly the person that can help you with your information. Um, Miriam can also, if you are looking for your data that you submitted, she can also download your report for you and send that to you so that you can use it for creating your infographic. Uh, thanks for your time. And I am going to pass the ball to Corrine Weidenthal from, I'm sorry, Corrine Weidenthal from um, OSEP, who is the project officer or one of the project officers for the Promise Projects. So this is Carmen again. Before we turn it over to Corrine, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. One, um, I think most of the parent centers are quite knowledgeable about having had this infographic. I think that SIPRA did it last year also. So each year it gets better. So I really encourage you to download that infographic and see how it could be useful uh, to your center. So let me say a little bit about the purpose of the webinar, which is uh, Corrine's going to discuss in detail um, um, more detail what Promise was about, and it was a very large investment of in um, for the department. And those grants are now um, ending. But through the grants, a lot of the grants also did a lot of work with the parent centers, and we wanted to share with you the kinds of learnings that happened from the project and how that can be used in moving forward as we work with. Um, the most vulnerable of populations. So in addition to Corrine, who's going to give you an overview of the Promise Grants, we're also going to be hearing from Tisha Harry, who worked with um, in specifically in Montana as part of the Aspire project, from Sid Van Corsel from Warmline, the Parent Center in Northern California, who worked with the California Promise Center, uh, from, um, I'm sorry, Carol Rudell, who also worked with the Aspire Project, and lastly from Susan Barlow from the Parent Center in New York, who worked with the Promise Center in New York. I want to thank them all for being on this webinar. I want to thank David Emenheiser, our colleague here in uh, OSEP, for organizing the webinar and um, getting this information to you, because we really think there's a lot to be learned from that. So. Um, what you see in front of you right now is a quick poll, and I encourage you to take it, um, and then we'll turn it over to Corrine. So please select one of these uh, topics, whether or not how familiar you are with the Promise Initiative. So with that, let me turn it over to Corrine. Great. Thanks, Carmen. Yes, please take the poll. Um, I'm very interested to know if I need to spend three minutes or five minutes on my portion of today's presentation. Will we be able to see the results before I start? Um, yeah, Corrine, right now, there you see right there, yep. yeah. Great, great. So it looks like the majority either are very familiar or somewhat. So that's, that's very helpful information. So <clears throat> I will do a very brief overview on the background of Promise which was um, began in the fall of 2013 and is ending in September. However, the projects do have a no-cost extension, and many of them are, will be providing services until September of 2019. So we still have a, a little ways to go. Um, actually. So I should have said the previous administration, this was proposed, the Promise Program was proposed in fiscal year 2012 um, by the previous administration to improve education and career outcomes for youth with disability on uh, receiving supplemental security income. And um, they wanted to foster the uh, interagency collaboration. And six grants were awarded in uh, 2013, and we'll be showing you a map of those uh, shortly. But um, the total budget was approximately $231 million. 
across the six projects. Next, please. So it aims to encourage ways of providing support and to build an evidence base on the effectiveness of interventions related to transitioning to post-secondary education and employment. So we are trying to build the evidence through uh, random control trials, um, which we hope will show some impact um, at the end of our uh, study, which we still have a ways to go for that, but next. Uh, we work in very close partnership with other federal agencies, Social Security, Human Re HHS, and Labor. Uh, Social Security administers a contract for the national evaluation. Next, please. I'm not going to go through this, but this is our conceptual framework that uh, that Mathematica Policy Research, our national evaluator, developed early on. And I do have a citation there if you're interested in reading a bit more about the evaluation design. Next, please. So uh, the projects had about a year and a half to recruit uh, their participants, and they all met or exceeded uh, their recruitment targets and enrollment targets. So there are a total of 13,172 participants who began at the age of 14 to 16. Um, and as you can see, there's the total enrollment of 13,444. As I mentioned, it is a random control trial to test interventions. And the uh, control group continues to receive the typical services available to them in their state, so no services were withheld at any time. Next, please. There's the map of the projects. Um, it worked out very well to have them coast to coast. Aspire, who you will hear from, is a consortium of six states. Next, please. The lead agency who was awarded the grant had to be a state agency and uh, it had to be signed by the governor in that state. So they, you can see the lead agencies and they have a host of um, external partners. Next, please. So the core services and supports, um, as I mentioned, they're developing, they developed uh, many partnerships but their core services are case management, benefits counseling and financial capability services, career and work-based learning experiences, and they have to offer at least one paid uh, employment experience and in integrated settings at at least minimum wage. And uh, the parent training and information has been really key to all of these projects. They are working with uh, multiple OSEP PTIs and also uh, family resource centers and other family organizations in their states so that um, the families are a key uh, piece of this. They're, they're training um, not only youth, but working very closely with families. Next, please. And this is a little bit about the national evaluation. As I mentioned, you can read more about it in that uh, citation, but they're collecting multiple data from many sources. Um, there soon will be some process analysis reports up on the SSA website where they uh, interviewed families and youth eight, 18 months after enrollment. So um, there's some potential impact in there and certainly some lessons learned and accomplishments. It will soon be available. Next, please. Um, each project, ha each of the model demonstration projects uh, have to evaluate their own projects through formative or performance measures. And then they all have a management information system where they are tracking multiple um, layers of data. Next, please. Uh, AUCD 
was awarded the Promise PA Center in 2014. And on the next slide that you can go to, you will see the, the website where you can find information about, go to each of the project's websites and other resources. So with that, I will turn it over to, I think Tisha's next. Thank you. Thanks, Corrine. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Tisha Harry. I am the site coordinator for Aspire in the state of Montana. Um, I will be talking about reaching families separated by geography and the barriers to access that go with that. Um, can you hit the next slide? So when we're talking um, about reaching families separated by geography, I'm going to get a little bit of context first. So um, Aspire Montana is just one of six rural states in the Aspire project. Uh, Montana itself is the fourth largest state in the U.S with a very small population of just over a million people. We have four case managers to cover the entire state, but because of our geography, we have very high rates of what we call windshield time. In fact, in some cases, our case managers have to travel three and a half hours in one direction just to meet with a single family. Uh, next slide. So in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about two different kinds of separation. Um, I'll talk about families separated from services because of geography, and I will talk about families separated from each other because of geography or living apart. And I'll be talking about the barriers and what we've been doing because of it. So next slide. All right. So um, when we're talking about the barriers that are created by families separated from services due to geography, um, some examples of that are just services in general. When you're talking about a rural location, there's significantly fewer options uh, for services available to these families uh, simply because it's a rural um, location. Um, in addition to that, transportation is very limited. There's no taxis, no Uber, no transit systems of any kind. So if a family doesn't have their own vehicle, they're essentially without access to the few services that do exist in that area. Um, employment opportunities are smaller, limited education opportunities. Um, there's typically only one school in a rural location. Uh, oftentimes that's 10,000 or less people. Um, that one school is often K through 12. There's no colleges, no adult education centers, and very limited extracurricular activities for these youth. Next slide. So, um, to alleviate some of the barriers to uh, services because of geography, our solution has been to bring the services to the families. So our case managers meet the families at locations they can, the families can easily get to. This may be a home or a local diner. Uh, mornings and evenings and sometimes even weekends are the times that we need to meet with these families. We pay other agencies to bring trainings to our families in rural areas. And this includes some parent, uh, parent training centers. Um, these agencies are already providing services in urban areas. So essentially, we're seeding them with the funds uh, in order to build their capacity to serve in rural areas. We also use technology. Uh, we bring computers and smartphones to participate, or so the families can participate in webinars, webinars, online trainings, or um, approved videos that we, we have viewed ahead of time. And sometimes, um, I might mention that our families don't have their own technology, so our case managers bring their computers and let the families use it while the case manager is there. And finally, we participate in education services by attending IEP meetings, coordinating tours of colleges, um, Job Corps, adult education opportunities, and more. Next slide. All right. So even with these accommodations, we still have ongoing barriers. Um, the agencies that we pay to provide the trainings often have difficulty finding places to facilitate those trainings. Um, bars and gas stations in small towns are not very practical locations to hold trainings. While we have provided financial backing for agencies to travel to rural locations, this doesn't alleviate all the travel issues. Um, for instance, we must account for the time it takes to get to those locations, both for the trainers and the case managers. 
and construction and weather are a real issue. Every one of our case managers um, and a lot of our trainers up here have experienced inclement weather and had to um, turn back from a training. And then learning the resources in several small areas. This means working with multiple rural areas. Um, that means you have to know all the different services in multiple areas, and this is very time consuming. And then finally, limited cell service. So even when our case managers and trainers bring their own technology to share with the families, there are times we can't even use it. So next slide. All right, so this next part and final portion is gonna be about families separated from each other because of geography. Next slide. All right, so just a couple examples of what I'm talking about. It's not something we anticipated um, in the beginning, but we deal a lot with family members that live apart from one another. And this could be a youth living in a group home while the family remains in their hometown, a youth that lives in a completely different state with their grandparent while their parent or legal guardian lives in another state. Or maybe the youth has turned 18 and moved out, or the youth has decided to join Job Corps and doesn't live with their family. Uh, there's a lot more, but you get the idea. So our next slide. This uh, family separation causes barriers. For instance, parents become less engaged when they're separated from the youth. Um, because of the separation, an outside entity <laughs> more knowledgeable, sorry, knowledgeable about the youth than the parent themselves. And parents who often retain guardianship of their youth, even though they're separated, this causes a really big barrier um, because when the youth is trying to obtain a driver's license or sign up for a service like vocational rehabilitation, or maybe they're registering for school or getting a signed release of information or some type, having that separation from their parents creates a significant barrier in um, being able to access certain services. Next slide. All right, so um, a couple other barriers. Um, there can be a lot of legal confusion when parent and youth are separated by geography. If a parent is um, in one state and attempts to obtain guardianship over their adult child maybe in another state, there's the question of which court system do we use? Lots of legal questions come into play. And finally, we've encountered the inconsistency of services uh, in differing locations. Even if the services are being provided by the same organization, they can look entirely different when they're implemented in more than one location. This can cause issues for a family trying to access the same service in two geographic locations. So that's a big barrier. Next slide. All right, so to accommodate these uh, families separated from each other, we found that connecting with both the youth and the parent regardless of location is vital. In our case, uh, each case manager visits both parents and the youth separately if necessary on a monthly basis. Um, if both, if the parents are, and the child are separated by state, and both states happen to be Aspire states, uh, we assign a case manager from each state to each family member. And um, the Aspire states also have the benefit of sharing a database. So case managers can share information and documents by uh, using that database. And um, we have had to educate ourselves and families on procedures and policies of the alternative residence or living location, whether that be a hospital, a group home, or other location. Um, we also make sure the parents understand that they are still the parent, and in many of those situations, they still have a say in what happens to their child. You'd be surprised at how many parents don't think they do. Next slide. All right, so in addition to that, case managers encourage and facilitate communication between parents and additional entities in the youth's life. When a parent and youth live in different states, we often coordinate and attend various appointments with the youth, then report back to the parent how it went and what steps need to be taken. Finally, we investigate services that are available in all geographical areas and educate the families on both. Um, this is especially important when the services vary in each location. So overall, we have certainly recognized that there must be a team approach. This is requiring 
a partnership of multiple agencies in order to truly reach these families in rural locations. Um, next slide. All right. So this is my contact information. If you have any questions, I will be happy to talk to you about anything and give more specific examples if need be. So that's it for what I have today. Thanks. Good morning. Um, my name is Sid Van Corso. I'm the project director at the Warm Line Family Resource Center in Sacramento. Uh, we serve 26 counties in far northern California. Um, I apologize for the voice. Um, hopefully I'm going to be able to get through this pretty quick. Warmline is a parent training and information center and an early start, which is Part C Family Resource Center in California. And in California, the FRCs were the partners in the California Promise Grant. Next, please. So our question was, how does Warmline raise parent expectations of possible outcomes for youth, sorry for the typo, with disabilities? Um, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because I think it's certainly the PTIs who are on the line grapple with this every day. Um, from experience, we know that the parents of disabled youth are frequently at a loss at what outcomes to expect for their children. Um, they don't know what types of services and supports the youth is going to need. They don't know what they're going to want. More importantly, they don't know what's available. And the outcome of that is low expectations for the youth. Next, please, Miriam. So traditionally, parents of children with disabilities are not led to have high expectations for the children. Um, many parents have no idea that their adult child can have a life independent of them, um, paid employment, and social ties. And as they contact Warmline, they express frustration, confusion, fear of the unknown. Um, and mostly that equates to frustration with, with schools and agencies, confusion over programs, and just outright fear of the future. And because we are all parents here, we provide that listening ear because we have had similar experience and several of our staff have uh, youth who have gone through transition. And one of the things we do regularly is, is encourage, encourage parents of all disabled students um, from a really, you know, very young age to just start asking what the kids want to be when they grow up. We, we all know that that happens for non-disabled children, but parents of disabled children frequently don't think to do that. And we know that the answer is less important than the question because that gives children um, a place to begin on their journey of self-determination. Next, please. So we have a few tools that we use to help provide, help parents have those high expectations for children. Um, first, we model it with our own children. And because several of us have been through the process, just here are our frustrations, here are the strategies we've used, and here are our children's triumphs. Um, we encourage parents from an early age to give their children choices and support them to self-advocate, advocate, advocate and dream big. We know, all of us, that big dreams drive us to try new things. We have trainings, for example, supported decision making, person-centered planning, and student-led IEPs. Next. Another tool that we use is a booklet that we created called Moving On to Adult Services. Um, it guides parents through the process of the adult services, um, features worksheets for student-led IEPs, person-centered planning, questions to ask adult service providers. Um, we hand this out at trainings. It's on the Warmline website on our special education page. We mail it to families on request, and we also provide it to partners so that they can provide it to families too. Next. 
We have an annual transition fair with Spanish vendors, Spanish-speaking vendors. Span we provide Spanish translators. Um, we did one in May that included Russian translators. And we do it at least annually um, with adult, local adult service providers, such as supported living, supported employment, um, social and recreation opportunities. And we always have some sort of a breakout uh, information session, such as uh, a panel discussion with self-advocates. And we encourage parents to attend with their youth. One thing that's been very popular is what we call Teen Talk and Parent Cafe. And they're concurrent ad activities where the two groups gather separately to discuss related topics. So for example, both groups might talk about self-advocacy, disclosure of disability, or person-centered planning. Next, please. Um, we provide information about ac local activities for youth, such as Special Olympics. Um, we know that those activities en enhance the social skills for children and youth. But the part that parents sometimes don't realize until they go is that parents really receive organic support from other parents of participating youth. And sometimes that this is that's the most important component of getting youth out in activities. Next. So here's my contact information and our my email our website, and you're certainly welcome to um, visit our website, go on the special education page, and take a look at moving on to adult services. Thank you. I think I'm handing this off to Carol. Yes, thanks, Sid. Hello. Mm -hmm. So I've been asked to share a little bit about uh, when families experience difficulties, crises, and trauma. Uh, you can move along, Miriam. One of the things that I think happens in all of our lives is that we're just plain busy. Uh, you know, children are in school, parents work, there's got medical appointments to go to. There's just an align for everything. Maybe it's to pay bills, maybe it's to report your earnings. Uh, as Tisha mentioned, a, a lot of our families are not connected electronically. If there's a line, it's usually for the computer at the library or at a workforce center. So even, even with connectivity, they're uh, having challenges around that. A lot of our families do use cell phones for everything, but gosh, they're small. It would be hard to watch webinars and other trainings and connect well uh, through that format. Certainly, there's a lot of daily things happening in families, and we can't forget the cultural or social expectations. In Aspire, we have quite a large population of American Indians, and there are definitely cultural expectations that are different from, say, my family or your family often, and so uh, being aware of those expectations is really important. Oh, next slide. So one of the things that we said in, uh, when we started Aspire was that we really need to build and maintain a foundation of rapport and trust. And it takes time. It doesn't happen because we show up today. It happens because we show up all the time. We become a constant. Oftentimes these families have revolving doors of service providers in their lives. And we've made a commitment that we're gonna be there every month. You'll see us every time we say we're coming. Um, so we've become a, a constant. We frequently stay in touch multiple times a month. Maybe that's texting, maybe it's sending a letter, sending flyers for parent center activities. Um, but whatever we do, we do it multiple times a month. And then we certainly meet face to face once a month, regardless of the distance that it takes to get there. Because in the end, we're really hoping to empower these families so they can overcome even some of their learned helplessness, that they can develop knowledge and skills and become more independent and self-sufficient. Next slide. As was noted earlier, all of the PROMISE projects are working with our PTIs. There's no question about that. And in Aspire, we're working with six different uh, PTIs. And they are one of six key interventions that we're providing. So in the midst of all of this busyness of daily lives, we still expect families to be active and participate. So we've established a core content to be delivered to families and parents. And we're hoping, we're intending, that they would attend six hours a year of workshops. Now, as you know, offering something and attending are two different things. So it doesn't always happen. Next slide. 
So these families not only deal with the day-to-day -day life thing, they are dealing with a lot of other crises and traumas. Perhaps it's financial. Maybe they don't have enough money to make rent this month. Maybe their food sources are limited. There's 31 days in the month and that snap just doesn't last quite as long. There's medical emergencies, unforeseen co-pays. Even if it's only a few dollars for Medicaid, it's still cash out of their pocket. Uh, sometimes there's relationships. Families split up or somebody joins the family for the week or for the month or for the year. So relationships change. These families also have mobility challenges, uh, getting around in their communities. Even if they need to seek medical care and the, and the nearest hospital is an hour away, how are they getting there? And personal care. Sometimes it's just a matter of being able to care for your own needs. So the challenges and crises that they face are real. Now, all of PROMISE is set up around all of these. Obviously, we're looking at increased education, improved employment, and greater self-sufficiency. Theoretically, we should be addressing all this. Next slide, please. So one of the th we've learned quite a few things, actually, about helping families through crisis. Obviously, don't get on the crisis coaster with them. Stay the course, maintain your expectation, and maintain your roles. Taking ownership of the problem surely won't help families become empowered and be self-determined about their lives. But it is important to listen and affirm their experiences. They're real. It's not our place to judge or patronize. Their experiences are their experience. It might not be my experience. It might not be your experience, but it's real. And then, of course, we really do have to recognize those cultural influences in the situation. How someone from, uh, in, for example, in some of our states, we have a high Polynesian uh, population. How do they handle crises as a community, uh, not just as a family? Next slide. It's certainly important to be empathetic. Um, I always tell people we can listen and, and use the information we have, but we're not there to commiserate. That's not going to help a situation. But we can accompany a family through these challenges. And it's not about my limitations. It's not about my calendar. And, and the example of driving three or four hours to visit with one family and they cancel when you're 30 minutes outside of town, yeah, that's frustrating. But we still need to make the time to meet with that family and figure out how to get back there quickly and adjust to their schedule, not our schedule. We can't be influenced by those constraints. And when the time is right, we need to be ready with the information and resources. There might not always be a perfect plan B, but if we know our resources and the services that are available to our families and their in their communities, then we can come up with alternatives to help them through those crises. Next slide. And in the middle of all that, we have to think, well, gosh, I still have a goal. I still have something I'm supposed to be doing with this family. And it's important to listen. That's I think all of us have said that. Uh, if we listen, to what a family is experiencing, and we can connect it to what our purpose is with them, regardless of what that purpose is. There's nothing that doesn't fit. It's just a matter of being able to make those connections. So look for those opportunities, connect with other parent education centers. The PTIs are fabulous. I'm, I've been a fan for many, many years, and the resources that you all can provide is something that we need to be sure families are aware of as well. But even in a crisis, there are always steps to a long-term solution. It's just a matter of making a plan, figuring out who can help, who's responsible, and then holding people accountable. Because no man is an island. It takes a community. And, and the adage of, of it takes a village to raise a child is true. No one of us has a corner on the market. Being able to keep everyone focused on those outcomes and keep moving forward is really critical. Next slide. So when I think about how we've looked at parent education and training in Aspire, we've had to evaluate a lot of different things. What day of the week are we offering classes? What time of day are we offering classes? Some families do better when their kids are in school so they can meet. Other times it's like, nope, we're just going to bring everybody and hope they have food when we get there in the evening. So looking at time, day of week, location is important. As, as Tisha pointed out, some of our smaller towns, the bar and the gas station is not the place to hold a workshop. So how are you going to do that? Uh, we've made a lot of adjustments. We've offered retreat style events where it included overnight stays with travel reimbursement. We've done joint trainings, and I think Susan, you mentioned that, where you have one thing, or Sid, sorry, you have one happening at the same time as another time. Uh, something going on for the youth, something going on for the parents. Uh, we've done recognition events, recognizing the successes that families do have, and included some short trainings in that, of course. We also do some what we're calling family connections, which are like mini orientations to um, all the services that are out there. And when we've had to, we've done one-on-one -on -one opportunities with parents. And we've actually increased the number of one-on-one -on -one opportunities for parents throughout the course of this project. 
Next slide. So I guess if I could give some advice of watch out and recognize things is recognize those cultural influences. In our six states, we have every culture you can imagine represented. And uh, each of those cultures are unique and bring characteristics to that family that we should respect and understand. Don't, be a, don't get into the Superman syndrome. It's not my job to sweep in and save the day. It's our job to empower families. And for some, maybe that means a bit of hand-holding at first, but doing it for them will never result in that self-determination. So accompanying them through a crisis and the trauma, that's the thing to do. And of course, the next one will come. There's no question about that. But it's really easy to develop that, oh, not again attitude. So it's really important to remember that everyone has a crisis, each one of us. But having a good attitude and moving forward will help us help us be able to achieve what they can um, what our successes are, what their goals are, what our goals are. Next slide. I am going to pass on the examples. I'm out of time. And the next slide is just my contact information. You're welcome to contact me anytime. Aspire is a big project and we have lots going on, um, but it certainly is very relevant uh, in terms of how we work with our parent training information centers. So thank you. And I think Susan, you're up next. So, you know what they say, last but not least, uh, I'm actually asked to speak about changing how our systems work together and our system expectations. So let me just give you a little background real quick about how New York State did it. Um, we have three locations where we focused our energies, primarily in urban areas, New York City, Albany, and in Buffalo. Each one of those was um, attached to a parent center. So we actually had contracts, promise contracts, uh, to work directly with the, co with the project. Um, each, each area had a team consisting of a case manager, family engagement specialists, providers of vocational services in the school districts. Uh, can you go to the next one? Thank you. And you can go to the next one after that. Okay, so one of, recently in April at one of our learning communities statewide, Cornell conducted a survey, a, kind of a focus group asking groups uh, these questions. And the, the next slide will cover some of the stuff we talked about. So identified were some major challenges with working in, with the family uh, centers primarily connecting with families and then maintaining the engagement, communicating, developing partnerships along with the service providers as well as the schools, and obviously capacity and consistency. Uh, I just want to point out under the service providers, one of the areas that I don't think we anticipated of a, of a real challenge was the workforce around the providers. Uh, in our area, we're, and I'm sure this is going on in different areas, we're seeing a real difficulty with uh, service providers being able to um, keep, retain staff, recruit and retain staff. Um, next slide. Thank you. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about the service, the, this lovely uh, slide that one of our Cornell people helped to develop. For us as an organization, as a parent center, entering into this promise grant, there were a number of areas that we had not had a whole lot of experience in or were providing to some extent. So for us, we were expanding our services. We were uh, expanding our, our populations in some ways. We needed to really deepen our understanding of cultural sensitivity. And we also had to expand our community. When we talk about our community, we're talking about we needed to learn more about family court, juvenile justice, housing, uh, food stamps, social security, and we needed to know at a deeper level what the providers were doing. I think from a parent center, this was a, a move into the deeper world of services outside of just our typical special education. Uh, and, and most importantly, we had to train our staff as it related to all these. Uh, next slide, please. Where I think we were most excited and where we are right now is before Promise, our parent center, and I think most of the parent centers uh, across New York State were at a tier one. 
in general, you call us, we give you information, we provide workshops, we do a little bit of follow-up, but we did not and we're not in a position to intensely provide the support that the families that we work with in Promise truly needed. Uh, at this point, I'd say, you know, five years later, we're working, we're doing a lot of hand-holding, we're doing a lot of empowering, and I'd like to just quickly tell you a story that would illustrate the success here. Uh, and, and also kind of feels like a little bit of a tease is this is where we want to stay because of the work that we're doing. So let me just tell you about Kim. Kim is one of our family engagement specialists. And Kim told me a story the other day that she actually asked me to share with you. And she was all excited because Tim, Kim had been working with this family for the past five years, supporting her, for supporting them. So when she first met this family, the mom would get letters from Social Security and not open them. And she'd go to her house and she'd actually go through her mail with her and say, here it is. This is the letter I'm looking for. So they opened the mail, they would look at the mail, and then she would explain what the letter says. And then they would go to meet with Social Security. And the first time they met with Social Security, uh, Kim found herself having to do most of the talking. And the mom and, and the student basically sat and listened. So that after a while, Kim was at that point modeling. And by now, we're five years later, Kim came in the office and said, so I went to this social security meeting with the mom and this time I got to sit and watch. And this mom spoke to the to this to social security with with advocacy, with intelligence and with with potential partnership. And I just think it's an important story to tell because ultimately this is the kind of support we're seeing that the families need. So you can go to the next slide before I just keep going on and on. Another important aspect is partnerships, and uh, some of my colleagues spoke about this uh, before, but as a result of, of Promise, and I can't say this enough, some of the partners that we have been able to deepen those relationships with now are calling us and asking us to write grants together. We're now doing shared staff meetings, and I think this is a really important uh, system, cost systems um, outcome, because it may not have happened if we weren't working so closely with them. And as my colleagues have said, you have to build trust across the board, and building trust through working with the students and the families has resulted in relationship building. So I, I just want to point out if I could do promise all over the again I would because all these relationships have just you know are blossoming in the next slide and these are uh, these are um, some of the uh, relationships that we've deepened I think as parent centers a number of us work with uh, a lot of these organizations as I said some of the the organizations in juvenile justice and family court uh, and criminal court uh, in, in probation are areas that we're finding ourselves having a, a much deeper relationship with now that we may not have had before. Uh, so, and you can actually go to the next slide. And these are the area, this is an important piece. And I spoke about it earlier. Um, we had to do a lot of training with our, with our Promise staff to understand, A, the data collection piece, um, the fidelity piece, as well as you know, knowing deeply the services that folks may need. I mean, like we've said before, families aren't really going to be uh, that into on and working with you unless you can also help them as a family. I have to just do a quick plug and then I will let you go. Um, if you want to see some very cool videos, you can go to the New York State Promise website and they're called podcasts, but there's some great videos. Uh, that will demonstrate uh, what Promise is all about. So on that note, because of timing, I'm going to let y'all go and go to questions and answers. Okay. You can go to the next slide. Thank you, Sue, and um, all our other uh, presentation uh, presenters, Tisha and Carol and Sid. Uh, for these presentations. We do have some questions that have been coming to me privately. One of them has to do with how much 
money, either as a percentage or as an actual amount, um, was dedicated to these kind of outreach activities in your uh, promise grant. This is Carol. Would you like me to field that one? Oh, yeah. So when we were uh, making our applications for Promise, we were allowed to request only six thousand five hundred dollars per youth that you and up to two thousand essentially. Or in California's case, they had more, so they received more. But if we said we were going to recruit and enroll two thousand youth, then that case basically comes out to. $32.5 million. So, uh, of course, half of the youth are assigned to the control group or usual services. So, essentially, you're talking about $13,000 per youth. It's a pretty cheap project for what outcomes we're getting. So, $13,000 per youth for both the services and the outreach? No, $6,500 each. So, yeah. For the outreach? I'm, 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 maybe I'm not tracking. It was 6,500 per youth for all the services together. Everything, right. Mm -hmm. All recruitment, okay. outreach, enrollment, and services after enrollment, everything. Okay. And you also said that um, that was quite inexpensive for the results you've been seeing. So can you talk a little bit more about your evaluation? I understand that it's not completely in yet because you're you're finishing up the projects and you're going into most projects are going into a one year no cost extension. But what is what are some of the preliminary data, especially compared to the control group? So in our formative evaluation in Aspire, we have we do uh, phone surveys for our youth, for an example. So we are doing phone surveys only of our control group versus our uh, treatment group. And in essence, what we're finding is. Uh, that there are youth who do attend things which are not being attended by the control group. Um, they're more likely to be employed. They're more likely to pursue post-secondary education. They're more likely to remain in school. So we are seeing some statistically significant difference between our treatment and control group. Okay. Anybody else? Want to address the question of the of, of what you're seeing in the evaluation? So Nora has a comment. She can you hear me. Yep. Okay. Nora writes in. Uh, Pilots are great, and the results seem amazing. What are the chances this program will be funded to continue and and to grow to cover the entire country? Again, this is Carol. I, my quick answer to that is the word sustainability was never in the announcement. Uh, it is a research study, so it has to end, and then it has to be studied so that we can determine if there are truly these outcomes that are expected of increased education, improved employment, and greater self-sufficiency and less dependence on public benefits. Uh, we won't know if that has actually happened until uh, Mathematica Policy Research completes their 60-month survey and then analyzes their data. So it could be a few years, but at that point, you know, I'm hopeful that there are some significant results that would result in some changes to the four, say, the, uh, the practices or the policies within our four federal agencies who are our partners. But that's yet to be determined. Great. Uh, Kathy asks, is the $6,500 per youth per year or over the entire length of the project? Sorry, I was having to unmute myself there. <laughs> okay. um, that's basically uh, the entire project. Okay, so $6,500 per youth over the course of the project. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Post them in the question box, and um, let's see if we can. And get you can them. also um, feel free to raise your hand, and then we can unmute you if your if your hand is raised, and then you can ask the question directly. So 
So while we're waiting for possible questions, let me ask uh, another question of um, for Tisha and Carol, since you're in state agencies, um, how has being involved in the Promise Project changed your work in in other areas or in other things that you do, or that you, if you haven't had a chance, I mean, if you're not doing other things right now because you're just so involved in, this, um, in the Promise Project, how will it change moving forward in your other work? And then the same for the, the for Sid and Sue, how have in being involved in the Promise Projects changed the way in which you might be doing the work at the parent centers? You, you, all of you have sort of touched on this, but I just wanted you to sort of expand on that a little bit more. So this is Sue Barlow, and one of the things that I think it has done is, ha as an as an organization, as an executive director to a parent center, it's put it's it's refocused some of my energy in where to look for funding for the future. In terms of having a much closer relationship with our Department of Social Services, with our Department of Health, and look at the possibility of expanding into becoming more of a navigator slash coach in a way to support families in a more intensive way. Great. Sid or Tisha or Carol? And if you're talking, I think Sid, you're, you're muted. And so you, Tisha. Well, this is Carol. You know, we have, um, oh, we were all I'm required. unmuted now. Oh, then oh. go ahead, Sid. Oh, I just, I, I echo um, the last statement that it has really uh, improved our partnerships with agencies that work with that age group and has given us the the opportunity to just expand everything that we were we were already doing so it's been a terrific opportunity and this is Carol what I would add is that you know we work we were required as projects to partner in our projects with, uh, I think it's seven, and I'm going to never be able to remember them all, but the mental health agency, the DD agency, the VR agency, the TANF agency, the labor agency, the WIOA agency. So we, we were required right up front to build relationships. And, and I think all of us as Promise Projects, some of that existed. Uh, I, I mean, there's all kinds of of WIOA, for example, or WIOA, for example, requires um, uh, uh, c councils that contain all these people, uh, it's just as one example. So it's, I think there, to some extent, there is um, already in existence a lot of those relationships, but I think the beauty of promise is it makes you sit down at the table and it's not about, well, them or what they do or what we do, it has become a total, collaboration, a true, what I would call partnering. You know, laws and regulations can make us sit down at the table and quote, collaborate, but to truly partner means we actually have common goals and, and a shared vision for how we're gonna get there. And I think that's what Promise has done in each of our states. And, and in, in our case in Aspire, I see that even happening across our state lines and, and people working better together when they have shared purpose. Tanya has two questions. Well, actually, wait a minute. Uh, one, um, there was mention of the importance of cultural understanding and competency with respect to family and youth demographics. Can you share some examples of this and its impact on outcomes? Lisa, can you, re can you repeat I that, please? Say, yeah. I was just going to ask if you wanted me to repeat it. Uh, there, there was a mention of the importance of cultural understanding and competency with respect to family and youth demographics. Can you share some examples of this and its impact on outcomes? 
to the importance of cultural understanding and competency. Uh, with well, the families are working. Okay. This is Sid. We we already had um, Spanish speaking staff in house, but we've used them more extensively for some of our outreach, like the transition fairs. Um, we've used them for translation and just being the the hosts to the Spanish speaking families. And as I said, we also had a Russian speaker uh, come to our last transition fair to support our Russian-speaking families. And I, I don't know about the overall state outcomes. I think um, Corrine probably knows more about that. Um, there's another question. Um, Corrine can pipe in if she um, wants to answer it. Or what kind of work was done with the providers to help them increase their expectations for youth with disabilities. So often as parents and our staff, we hear from families that from an early age, it's the professionals who discourage them from having high expectations for their children with disabilities. That's from Diana. Can I just jump in on that one? Because we actually had an aha moment uh, throughout the, this project. Most of the providers that were uh, contracted to do the promise work in New York State uh, were, pro were providers for adult services, vocational rehab providers. And at one point, I think uh, the leadership in the promise grant at our state level realized we have to teach uh, the the youth piece to this, you know, the the working closer with the schools, but also just expectations of a teenager, and and that was just kind of a little bit of an aha moment, I think, at our state level. I also think, uh, Tisha, you wanted to weigh in on some of these questions. Yeah, sorry, I was muted, but I would agree with that. Um, for a lot of our providers up here, there was that moment where, um, who, or sorry, these providers that were working with adults, um, not not as many kids maybe, and then the shift from adults to focusing on kids, there was that moment where the providers went, now this, this is where we could potentially be effective. We'll start earlier and see if that will help, um, help and have a better outcome when they become adults. So that was that was a good aha moment up here as well in Montana. Great. Any other questions, comments? Uh, can Tisha, would you like to give an example of some of the cultural competencies we've learned about working with our American Indian tribes? I, I feel like I hear a plane landing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm sorry. Let me mute myself. <laughs> Carol, will you ask that question again? Oh, I, I just said, would you share some of the things we've learned around working with um, American Indian tribes and members versus non-members even, um, and what some of the strategies around that cultural competency piece? Sure. That has been an a eye-opening piece for us in the Aspire project. Aspire made a very intentional effort to get a very accurate representative population when we recruited people, and that included individuals off Native American reservations. And so in order to do that, we have to interact with each tribe's government in order to get permission to recruit off of specific reservations. Just in the midst of that, um, Every single, we have learned that every single tribal government is an entity of its own and it stands on its own. And we had to learn each government and how that government functioned and how we needed to get permission from those sovereign nations. In addition to that, we had to learn about um, these youth and, and what really triggered them. Uh, Carol and I were looking at some of the data in our database and recognized that there was a lot of parents who identified as American Indian and also associated with a tribe. They were enrolled. However, there were not as many youth that identified as Native American or 
or did identify as Native American, but were not enrolled in a tribe. And so when we went to tackle why that might be, we uncovered that there's um, a whole blood quantum conundrum amongst the tribes. And, and uh, essentially, um, in order to be an enrolled member of a tribe, some tribes, most tribes, require uh, an individual to meet a blood quantum requirement. And while the parents might maintain that blood quantum, their youth don't always meet that blood quantum. And so some of these kids who um, are identify as Native American are essentially what they refer to as walking in two worlds. They, they um, identify as Native American and white and feel kind of this identity struggle between the two worlds and which one do I choose? So that's certainly a component that we've had to um, address and Interestingly enough, there's this tear between these two worlds. You know, they have this false dichotomy, essentially, some of them, not all, uh, where they feel like they have to choose between one or the other. And um, we've experienced some very difficult identity crises among some of these youth, and we're trying to address that. And we don't always know what to do or how to go about it, but um, we're trying to be sensitive to those situations. That's an excellent answer. Uh, Diana had raised her hand, and so Diana, I unmuted you. Should you care to speak? And... Well, it's, it was a topic ago, and I think this this topic is really very important. You know, not just the overall cultural issues that you were talking about, but also, um, you know, real life barriers to um, to working with. Uh, families and youth from different, you know, populations. But the question that I was, that I had been asking was not working with the adult providers, although I think the adult providers also need to have their expectations raised. But really, by the time parents have youth that are, you know, ready for the Promise Initiative, we have often heard for 14 or 18 years from other professionals, doctors, schools, therapists, you know, etc., that we shouldn't have high expectations for our children that we should you know basically even even we hear from families that even today doctors will tell them if they have a child with down syndrome that they should institutionalize their child when that's so you know far from the real potential for children with down syndrome today so that really was i guess i was you know thinking about did anything happen working with the the professionals that work with youth before the trans before they transition to get them to themselves have higher expectations and encourage parents to have higher expectations you know for their children that was my question thank you i'm gonna i'm gonna mute you again diana is that okay i muted myself okay anybody um, like to field that question this is Tisha. So I think um, definitely um, when some of our um, results started coming in and we were able to correlate, correlate uh, the self-determination trainings with increased um, education and independent living. And so some of these, some of these numbers started coming in we started seeing that there was definitely a significant um, effect occurring uh, because of these interventions being provided. Once people started seeing that, once those professionals started seeing those numbers, eyes lit up and some, some um, I guess it was, we were able to combat that idea that no matter what we do, it's not going to work, that, that concept of that. Um, so that's certainly something that I've noticed up here. So this is Carmen. Um, from what you all have been saying, I think it would be really interesting once Mathematica's evaluation is finished and and um, you know in the in the record book, so to speak, um, that we maybe have another webinar because I think what may come out of this is a kind of a validation of the kind of work that a, um, the Promise Grants did. Um, and also the kind of validation of the kind of work the parent centers do routinely in terms of encourage parents to have high expectations for their children, to meet parents where they are, 
um, not to be judgmental, to acknowledge those kinds of cultural differences, the kinds of things that we've been talking about. Um, so it seems to me that this would be really ripe for another um, webinar once that uh, findings are, are finalized and published. Um, so given that it's 4.10 um, and it doesn't look like we have other questions, I think I want to um, thank all our presenters. Please rest assured we're going to um, save this and archive this this webinar so that others can listen to it and you can um, also download um, you know, the handouts also uh, for your reference. And um, I will talk with Deborah, I mean with um, Corrine and David as things move forward so that we can bring back to you some of the results um, of the evaluation at another point. Um, did somebody else want to say something? I heard somebody trying to jump in. Maybe not. Um, so with that, I want to thank our presenters. I want to thank Carol and Sid and Tisha and Sue um, for all their work on the panel. I want to remind you that the SIPR has wonderful resources online now so that you can share your data about the kind of work you do as parent centers. And thanks, everyone, again, and to have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.